Good morning and welcome to the time of the Writer Festival. We meet again exactly a year after coronavirus put our work into a standstill. The national lockdown imposed in 2020 meant that most of the festival could not take place in its physical form. Through courage and resilience, the Center for Creative Arts at the University of KwaZulu-Natal adopted its 23rd time of the Writer Festival and went online. Through our championing spirit, we became the first South African arts festival to venture on an online platform. I am Sipindi Lehlongwa, the curator for the literature festivals at the Center for Creative Arts. The year old Center for Creative Arts is located within the School of Arts under the leadership of the Dean of the School, Professor Nobuhle Shongwa. The time of the Writer Festival is made possible by our various sponsors and partners, and let's hear from them. On the eve of the 2020 Time of the Writer Festival, presented by the Center for Creative Arts at the University of KwaZulu Natal, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced the national state of disaster. South Africa went into a national lockdown. Festivals had to shut down. The Center for Creative Arts went into immediate re-strategizing and re-envisioning how it would present the 2020 Time of the Writer Festival. Within a day, the Time of the Writer Festival went down in South African cultural history as the first South African Arts Festival to go online or in the virtual space as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The human spirit is inconquerable. We can reimagine, we can re-strategize and we can reinvigorate simply because we recognize the enormous potential of the arts to, ident to help us identify, define and develop our humanity. As we continue to invigorate and re-energize the art sector and find new ways of continuing to express ourselves, we also do so with an immense amount of sadness. We mourn the loss of the writers, directors, theatre makers, poets, writers and other South Africans that we have lost to the pandemic. We express our condolences to their families, friends, communities and their fans. At the same time, we also express an enormous amount of gratitude to our partners, funders, philanthropists who continue to support the arts and who value the role that our arts continue to play even at the most difficult time as now. In the same breath, we condemn the public officials who were entrusted with public funds to administer support for artists and who have maladministered those funds and invoked a climate in which artists continue to suffer even more than what they did before COVID-19 hit us. We also express enormous amount of solidarity and commitment to the artists whose bodies and voices continue to protest against corruption, maladministration, gender-based violence, crime and all the other scourges that continue to plague our nation. The arts are a vital part of our democracy as much as they are a vital part of our economy. The artists in our country have always borne witness there have been canaries in the mines and they continue to testify. This year's theme for the Time of the Writer Festival is the writer as witness, as canary in the mine and as testifier. We believe that these three roles are incredibly important to defend our democracy. Our democracy was hard earned and we have a responsibility to endow it to future generations. The Center for the Creative Arts values the support that it receives from the university leadership and from all our partners and particularly the artists whom we work with to be able to ensure that we create a platform for dialogue that will allow us to engage with our democracy so that we can create the systems and the opportunity through which we're able to endow it to future generations of South Africans. Enjoy the festival. Can you imagine a world without music? No books, no color, Many coped with lockdowns because of movies, art, comedy, but theatre and dance were devastated. Curfews shut theatres, festivals were cancelled, numerous creatives succumbed to COVID. Enter the Sustaining Theatre and Dance Foundation, STAND. 
Stan's mission is to support contemporary dance and theatre and those who make their livelihoods within these. But we need you to stand with us. Subscribe to the Stan Foundation for 100 Rand per month in exchange for weekly curated content, such as staged readings of new plays, interviews with top directors, links to international productions, and still more. We're still standing. Now help us to dance again. And together, we'll be more alive. IFES is a platform for cooperation. Encouraging cultural diversity and exchanges between South Africa, France, and the rest of the African continent. From performing arts to the visual arts, from literature to gastronomy, all cultural fields are honored. Welcome to Masri South African Museum of Literature. Amazwi is the new name of the former National English Literary Museum, which now has a mandate to collect literary artifacts from all the linguistic communities of South Africa. Amazwi is housed in a new museum building, and it is the first museum building with a five-star accreditation from the Green Building Council, South Africa. The museum aims to lead the implementation of sustainable museum practice in South Africa, both internally and externally. Societal and environmental issues are important in our museum programming. The dynamic and interactive permanent exhibition called Voices of the Land is about the literary representation of the South African landscape from early times to the present day. Through literary imaginings, the landscape is presented as a physical space with its long history of ownership of conflicts and as an aesthetic symbol of cultural identity. The exhibition is based on South African literature in seven languages. Amazwi has two satellite museums, Shrana House in Craddock and the Eastern Star in Makanda. The Eastern Star is a printing and press museum, while Shrana House in Craddock is a small house museum where the famous author of The Story of an African Farm, Olive Schreiner, lived with her siblings in the 1860s. The exhibitions at Schreiner House explore her life and work and recognize her significance as a writer, a feminist, and as a champion of human rights. Some of her personal possessions and part of her fascinating library are on display. Amazwi's participation in events like the Time of the Writer enables it to increase its reach beyond the boundaries of Makanda and Craddock. Despite the distressing social, psychological and economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, physical isolation has inspired innovation in the digital and virtual spheres and our work. Amazwi is proud to present two exhibitions at the virtual 24th Time of the Writer International Festival. Eskia Mpachlele, Man of Letters, and Old Man Africa Shouting at the World, an exhibition about Tatumkulu, Africa. Imbeza Journal for African Writing is an inclusive publishing platform that combines imaginative and scholarly writing. It bridges the gap between cultural workers, critics, and academics to cater for diverse audiences across the spectrum of society. By naming this journal Imbeza, we model it on the three-legged part which has been producing food for generations of African communities. The pot is a symbol of nourishment, strength and endurance, withstanding fires on which it stands. The three legs of the African pot, the round shape and handle, 
all symbolize the spirit of communality, partnerships, and working together. We cherish partnerships that contribute to the development of an and building a nation of readers. We are proud to be a media partner to a festival that amplifies the voices of writers, activists, and social commentators. Together, let us produce a feast of literature and intellectual engagement. Embeza Journal, nourishing the mind, nurturing a nation of readers, We express our appreciation to our partners who enabled us to create dynamic opportunities for our writers and audiences to engage each other's minds. This year's festival is anchored on its evocative theme of the writer, whistleblower, canary in a mine, or a testifier. The festival theme is inspired by a quote by a novelist, Daisy Hernandez, the writer whistleblower, canary in the mine, or testifier. While it may well be that no book has ever prevented genocide or fascism, we still have a necessity for literature to testify to the political conditions of our lives, not only so that we might have a record of those we have lost, but also that we might have a reason to gather with others to read and to continue resisting. Zugi Sawana is a writer, editor, and publisher born in Zambia to a Zimbabwean mother and a South African father, raised in Zimbabwe and currently based in Kenya, but who considers the whole Afri of the African continent her home. Her debut novel, The Madams, was shortlisted for the K. Selotuka Award in 2007. Her third novel, Men of the South, was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers' Prize Best Book 2011 and the Herman Charles Bosman Award. In 2014, she was selected as one of Africa's 39 Sub-Saharan Writers Under 40 with the potential and talent to define trends in African literature. In 2015, she won the K. Salo Duca Memorial Literary Award for London, Cape Town, Joburg. In 2016, she was a Danish international visiting artist hosted by Worldwide Words. In 2018, she was a fellow at the University of Johannesburg's Johannesburg Institute of Advanced Studies. In 2020, she was awarded the Gute Medal alongside Ian McEwan and Elvira Espajo Aika making one of the first African women to win the award. The 24th edition of the Time of the Writer Festival is deeply honored to have Zugi Sawana deliver the inaugural Time of the Writer keynote address. Greetings to everyone, wherever you may be in the world, but particularly to those in Durban, where the 24th Time of the Writer should be taking part. Before I begin my keynote, I would like us to have a moment of silence from Tobozi Sintumba, who was killed by the South African police on the 10th of March at Pitts University. The title of my keynote is the writer's voice in a political, social, and artistically conscious world. In this 24th year of Time of the Writer Festival, as we face the global pandemic for the second year, it seemed important that as I look at the larger festival team, the writer, witness, canary in the mind, or testify, I focus too on the writer's voice in a political, social, and artistically conscious world. I focus on this because it's the world we need. For what is writing without politics or society? And how meaningful is it if not executed artistically? Many readers in South Africa and some on the continent are familiar with one of the festival guests, Nibu Shongo's Dog Eat Dog, 
and Tanum Kolozanas and Importance. In the two novels, the protagonists, Dings in Doggy Dog and Zizi in Unimportant, find themselves fighting an education system set up to make it near impossible for poor students to attain higher education. Many would say in Klomo and Kolozana were canaries in the mine, foreseeing the doom or revolution, depending on which side of power you sit on, that was to come in our universities. The roads must fall and fees must fall protests. But I, a black child in this country, on this continent, knew when I read them what they were talking about. I knew people who had experienced the same, and so to me, they had written from their past experiences of being students and were testifying. As a matter of fact, 14 years ago, as a debutante, when I was invited to the 10th time of the writer, with my first novel, The Madams, near doom, even through humor, about how race relations in this country could destroy friendships. I was using Tandy, Lauren, and Nosizwe's engagement to speak on what I could see, but hoped the paler members of our society would realize. In so doing, I hope this 10% of our nation's population would rethink their engagement with the majority of the country's population who are darker. Instead, this, my fellow compatriots, relegated me to black chick lit. In publications that forgot that the majority of this country's population is black and women, or to use their term, chicks. That the majority of the country's book buyers are black chicks. In a country that does not have a literary category called white dick lit. The year 2020 was bad for artists globally, as it was for domestic workers, manual laborers, the hospitality industry, the airline industry, and many other sectors of our society. It was worse for the unemployed. Hope was lost. Family members who used to assist could no longer do so. In the midst of us all struggling to make sense of it, some things happened. COVID deaths and other deaths that could have been avoided. On 10th April, 2020, South African soldiers killed our brother, Collins Kosa, who was sitting at his home having an alcoholic beverage because booze had been banned at that time. The soldiers have been suspended, but almost a year later, no one has been convicted. Kosa's loved ones have been robbed of justice because we all know justice delayed is justice denied. We're writers, we're witnesses, and we can testify. On 25th May, Africa Day, a policeman put his knee on the neck of brother in the United States, killing him. African leaders made a statement. They swiftly condemned what was happening in the United States of America. They told us, Black Lives Matter. As writers, we put out a statement in solidarity with our siblings in the United States. We dared to hope that with their statement too, African leaders had woken up to the injustices against Black people and were not just using Brother George's death for political expediency. On Twitter, Ethiopian writer Maza Mengistu would remind us daily how many days it had been since the death of our sister, Breonna Taylor, and how none of the police who had been there had been held accountable for a murder. We were writers. We are writers. We are witnesses. We can testify. On 3 June 2020, police in Brazil fatally shot 14-year-old Joao Pedro Matos Pinto as he sat in his aunt's living room with his cousin and friends. My son Hinta was a few days to 15, so it hit hard. Joao too was my son. The African Union said nothing. I spent my fourth birthday on 30th July canvassing signature on a statement because Zimbabwean journalist Popol Chimono had been arrested by the Mnangagwa regime next door for daring to expose them for stealing funds that should have been used for COVID. 
A day later, former Time of the Writer Festival guest, Titi Dangarembwa, was arrested for doing a protest, questioning the government's treatment of citizens, a right enshrined in the Zimbabwean constitution. They arrested Ms. Dangarembwa while she walked along with a placard in her hand, wearing a mask. They could not even use the now old and abused COVID violations as an excuse for the arrest. In both the Chingwana and the Dangaremba instances, there was no word from the president of Zimbabwe's largest trading partner, my country's president, and the then African Union chair. Neither was there word when lives were lost during protests in the Democratic Republic of Congo. On 20th October, Nigerian government forces fired on peaceful protesters, officially killing 12 during the NSAS protests at Leki Top, Top Plaza in Lagos. As writers, we wrote a letter in solidarity as we mourn the deaths of these, our brothers and sisters. But again, there was no word from African Union and its then chair, my country's president. And there's been silence from the African Union for a very long time over attacks on civilians in Cameroon by President Bia soldiers. It becomes clear then that the Black lives only matter to African presidents when they've been taken by white people in the United States or in Europe. It seems the nature of the African Union not to say anything whenever their allies are involved. China's racism towards Africans, India's gagging of Kashmiris, Brazilian police killings of black people, any African government against its citizens. We were writers. We are writers. We are witnesses. We are witnesses. We can testify. We shouldn't have been surprised or a Cyril, Buhari, Nangaba, and Uburu love to say, shock. And yet we were. As writers, as readers, as citizens, as citizens who read, as taxpayers in our African countries. We have known what our government contracts with us are. We pay taxes, and they are supposed to justify through their works why we are paying taxes. Sadly, in all of Africa, our governments have treated us, the citizens, as though we are their slaves, and not as though they are our employees. As writers then, we are witnesses to this abuse and may feel the need to call it out. And because we look back so as to move forward, we know this has happened before. So while we may want to claim to be canaries in the mind, we probably are not. We're just engaging with our past and knowing how it will shape our future. And we seem prophetic only because our leaders are anti-intellectual, anti-literature, that they do not read so they too can heed the warnings. I hope this is the case. Because the alternative is that they do read and they know the past and how their decisions can damage, damage us. But they do not have this continent's citizens and interests at heart. That they are just is in Duna for Eastern or Western capital. I want to be wrong on the latter and right on the former and hope they can lead us and change the status quo. We are writers, we are witnesses. But here's the thing about being witnesses and testifying. If a tree falls in the forest and white media, think CNN, BBC, AFP, or ENCA, don't know it. Did it fall at all? If a writer writes, whether as a witness, can I read the mind or testify and no one reads it? As my friend and fellow Durbanite, uh, Azad Eza says, this question may also be related to the role of journalists on the continent. Journalists who are no longer asked to or expected to do serious journalism because no one wants to pay for the canary to go down the coal mine. The result is a type of news reported and a type of literature made up of noise and not ideas. 
It's about a systemic and latent disrespect for the arts and literature towards maintaining or becoming the witness, canary, testify. It's about extending this disrespect to future generations too, because it says we refuse to invest in imagination. The anonymity, this disrespect, allows writers to remain dispensable to the system. And a society that does not respect its artists is a society that is not interested in free speech. End quote. If a writer writes, whether as a witness, canary in the mind, or testifier, you no one reads it. Does it matter? I would posit that at the moment, it does not. How then do we get everyone questioning the abuse of domestic workers by their employees, employers, as shown in Makanaka Mavengeris, Perfect Imperfections, or festival guest Abby Darius, the girl with the loud voice? How do we know the intricacies of his term, as shown in Amata Aedu's Changes, or Lola Shonein's The Secret Lives of Baba Sidney's Wives? How do people get to question how liberators become oppressors if they have not engaged with Shima Chinojwa's subject of phones, waiting for the wild beast to opt by Amad Koroma on Koma Ongogi's Weaver's Cup? How do we, as South Africans, as Africans, know how patriarchy hurts all of us if we haven't read Angela Makolo's Black Widow Society or perhaps Vanus Men of the South? What I'm asking is how we make literature as significant and relevant as an art form as we do dance, music, or film. After all, literature, when well executed, not only entertains, but educates. At every literary festival, including this one, I have seen Omar Jaivan, singers, and sometimes films being created. And the participants bring another art form, fashion. Up and coming and established designers are worn by keynote speakers and other literary guests. I'm entirely grateful that I am not there in person in Durban because I cannot afford, afford to listen to yet. We invite Ihashe Limcho because we hope people will turn up for him and oops, discover books. It's not unique to South Africa. It is all over this continent. As an example, for the longest time, one of the prime literary festivals in Kenya was Tori Moja Festival. Tori Moja Festival kicked off as Nyama Choma's Tori Moja Festival. It was meant to attract cool people who wanted to have some bright meat. And as they were there, they would discover some writers. It seems literature practitioners and creators are so lacking in confidence that on this continent, we need to bring other art to the table to validate us. I have never seen writers invited to Jomba Dance Festival or Durban International Film Festival or Cape Town Jazz Festival. But perhaps this has much to do with our societies and their engagement with literature. South Africa, this continent, knows influencers with X amount of followers on Twitter or Instagram because they change cars frequently and showcase affluent lifestyles. We do not question where our influencers' finances come from. South Africa does not know who Zanem Bulamda or Sindwe Magwana or Nozizwe Jele are, even as they know all the actors and actresses who starred in the movie adapted from the latest novel, Happiness is a Four Letter Word. Heck, Durban does not know who Sisem Terem was, Fisom Zobe, Shabnam Khan, Ronnie Garvin, What to do? On Friday, 5th March, I was one of 400 artists who joined the National Arts Council's Presidential Employment Stimulus Program, PESP, webinar. 300 million rand was allocated to the arts. Among the applicants were council members. Yes. No one saw any conflict of interest. Council member advocate Marco Sinning Corsi told artists that they had a problem. They should take it up with the Minister of Sports, Art and Culture. Equally interesting was that some of the artists and organizations 
that received the grant are now being offered much less than what they were offered initially and can no longer execute what they wanted to do, while others got significantly more. All this in a situation where National Arts Council has run out of money and is asking for 3 million rand more from the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture so as to be able to pay artists who are approved to get the PESP grant. Where did the money go? Why has National Arts Council not seen fit to give South African artists the list showing each individual or organization that received the grant and equally important, how much they received and when it was dispersed? Why do they need a bailout? Today, Monday the 15th of March, marks 13 days since artists led by one of our nation's top opera singers, Swogile Ngoma, went to occupy National Arts Council demanding accountability on PESP funds. In fact, because the National Arts Council refuses to let artists know who got what, there is word that a quite for artists with ties to some council member received 9 million rand for a CD launch. This would be an easy rumor to discover. All the National Arts Council would need to do is make their books public. But perhaps this is a war that we literature Law on the National Arts Council, artistic sort of law, will not win. Literature, law on the artist, the National Arts Council sort of law, whatever do I mean? I speak from experience. Back in 2009, I applied for a grant while writing my third novel. National Arts Council offered me the princely sum of 25,000 rand. I was a single parent with fees to pay for a child. Somehow, the National Arts Council felt 25,000 rand, given in three installments, was enough to start to sustain me as I wrote the book, to pay rent, to pay fees, and to buy food. And I had to acknowledge them when the book came out. As my friend Sia likes to say, what a joke, my darling. What to do? As art, music has some role. Yes, yes, there are problems there too. But at least Budi Ringo knows where to go and protest when his royalties fall short. Our ministers consider music an art form to such an extent that they rightly lobby for more local content on playlists on our radios. Indeed, if memory serves, a former minister of art and culture decided to miss a gala dinner in Cape Town with Africa's first Nobel Literature Laureate, Wale Shoyinka, because he was going to hang out with pop artists at Durban July. How are you doing, Omar Shadile? Film has a national film and video foundation. Film and Literature's Flaws Relative Theatre has the Naledi Theatre Awards. Perhaps it's time that literature stands on its own. Maybe it's time for literature to have what Tandam Kolozana has fantasized about, a literature foundation. This foundation could be a blueprint for the continent. It would ensure that literature is accessed in villages as much as it is by the middle and upper classes. It would monitor that there's no Africana section in bookstores because Africana would comprise majority of the stock because where are we? Is this not Africa? Is there an Americana or Europeana section in bookstores in America and Europe? Writers would not need to witness, prophesy, or testify for the people who don't know that they've done so. People would do it for themselves. Our people across economic brackets would cut the work of the writers who are in this festival, who are in this world, because they know our works and they resonate. We would not hear such statements as African writers don't write sex, humor, crime, fantasy, sci-fi, romance, politics, YA, children's books. We have written those books. We are writing them and we shall continue to write them. A literature foundation built of publicizers. In villages, in farms, in townships across this great continent, children would chat. Refilo, refilo, let down your locks so I can climb the scraggy rocks. Because they would know about an African retelling of Rapunzel. 
maybe they would not even know of the brother scream version they would know Ngano as we heard it from our grandparents because we wrote them they would know Gambian writer Maimuna Jando summon the spirit of Mami Water so that they could know the history of the transatlantic slave trade all the way to our brother Eric Ghana whispering to yet another American policeman who had his knee on his neck I can't Our children would know why the chicken does not fly because their Nigerian brother, Namdi Anyado, would have told them. And as their parents read the stories to them, the parents would question their docility and inaction towards bad governance. Our continent would be immensely enriched if each country had a literature foundation where writers would not need to debate whether to take Mubi's side or Achebe's side on the language question. Because you see, writers, like painters, would paint in a color or language of their preference, but be certain that their work, if engaging enough, could be translated into another of our African languages. And our universities would not allow anyone to earn a master's degree in any language if they have not translated a book from this continent, from one language to another. Writers would not need to hear the question when they say that they are a writer. Yeah, but what exactly do you do for a living? Because everyone would know that writing is a profession. The Literature Foundation would also act as arbitrators between publishers and writers, providing auditing services where writers have queries about royalties. And no, even though we do not yet have the organization, our royalty fees would still travel from publisher directly to the writer, as happens now, and not through the foundation. We can never trust bureaucracy. The African continental free trade area, which many of our countries have signed and ratified, would also ensure easier movement of books and cancel VAT on books because how can we take this knowledge and art? Why would we take art knowing what we have learned during this pandemic about its ability to heal us? Educated but unemployed villagers would work as librarians teaching literacy through our stories. We would have literary awards where people would fight for an invitation as much as they do for music or film or theater awards. Because our leaders would understand that a reading continent is a leading continent, more so as it already has all the other resources the rest of the world wants. As a country, as a continent, we will be unstoppable. Because to be truly powerful is to have your own voice and tell your own story. And stories are literature, and literature goes hand in hand with literacy. Advoca advocacy, policy, grants for publishing and translation, an annual award ceremony, that will be part of what a literature foundation would do. Maybe I'm a dreamer. I know I'm a dreamer. Because to be a writer, an artist, is to constantly hope for the better. But I believe a lot of the phobias our society deal with, Afrophobia, homophobia, womanophobia, would be dealt with if people had access to literature. We would then realize that we all love, laugh, hurt, and want the best for our children and our siblings and our parents. And we would question our own judgment of others. We would question our othering of others. As writers, we can be witnesses, appear to foretell doom or testify. Unfortunately, as long as no one reads us and engages with our work, it will not matter. After the end of this 24th time of the Writer Festival, I can only hope we can begin to change the narrative. I'm Zuki Sorbana, a citizen, a lover and a believer in this rich but poor continent. I'm sometimes mistaken for a canary in the mind, but always, I'm a witness, a testifier, and always, a writer. I thank you. Fred Kumalo is a household name to the time of the Writer Festival. 
He has been described as a reluctant Zulu, clever black, and an equal opportunity offender. The Time of the Writer Festival is proud to announce Fred Kumalo as the inaugural featured author. This is what celebrated and specialist cultural journalist Sam Mate has to say about what makes Fred Kumalo worthy of this honor. Fred Kumalo is an established voice on the South African and indeed international literary landscape with no less than 12 books to his name in a brilliant career that spans 15 years. Totally committed to his craft, Fred is an entertaining and engaging master storyteller with a lyrical pen that is both serious and hilarious at the same time. A rare skill even among accomplished wordsmiths in the world of letters. A Yemen fellow and consummate multi-award winning journalist, he is a multi-dimensional writer who has distinguished himself in both worlds of fiction and non-fiction. His award winning debut no novel, Beaches Brew was released in 2006, following hot on the heels of his incredible autobiography, Touch My Blood, in the same year. Both were immediately impactful and heralded a literary journey that continues to explore and expose uncharted territory in this vast landscape of the great South African story. His works, including short stories, collection of essays, and children's books published in both Zulu and English, enjoy a wide readership as well as being studied as prescribed texts at tertiary institutions. Not to mention state adaptations locally and abroad. Dancing of the Death Drill, a remarkable historical novel that was inspired by the tragic story of the SS Mindy, was published in 2017 on the centenary of the sinking of the troop ship under the waters of the English Channel on 21st February 1970. First World War. A contingent of 600 mainly African non combatants known as the South African Net perished in the freezing waters. Spanning at least three generations, the extraordinary novel bears all the hallmarks of a Fred Kumalo thriller. It is a grand narrative that blurs the lines between history and fiction, a deserving winner of the Humanities and Social Sciences Award. Other impressive spin-offs include a West End stage production and a German translation. In 2019, he walked an epic 10-day journey of more than 450 kilometers from Johannesburg to Ladysmith in KwaZulu-Natal in a publicity stunt as he traced the footsteps of 7,000 African mine workers and their families who made this journey 100 years ago as they were fleeing the brewing military conflict between the gold-hungry British Empire and the Boer Republics. This daring and self punitive act was an unconventional way to mark the release of The Longest March, another groundbreaking historical novel based on true historic events during the Anglo-Boer War. The top five books President Cyril Ramaphosa selected among his festive season reads last year. With James Kumalo's writings challenge long-held assumptions, taboos, and stereotypes of
uh, Professor Bushe Shongwa and their team. The festival um, is online. It's uh, on social media. It is virtual. It's it's a pity that uh, writers like myself uh, cannot interact with uh, with, uh, with our audiences, with our readers, and sign their books and autograph them and so on. However, the positive aspect is that we now are going to hopefully reach uh, bigger audiences internationally. So wherever you are in the world, you can watch us debating, participating in uh, panel discussions that relate to literature and its function in society. Let me stress that. Books are not just the the refrigerated food for the bourgeoisie and so on, but uh, uh, books are a part of society, a part of uh, uh, our growth as, as human beings. And that is exactly what we try to do at time of the writer. I've been a participant at this festival almost every year for the past 20 odd years and I've interacted with the likes of uh, Woki Wationgo who's been here, um, the late Nadine Godima, our Nobel uh, Literary Prize winner and many, many, many authors from all over the world uh, who have converged on Durban to participate at the time of the writer. Now you have the opportunity to participate wherever you are in the world. Simply go online and see the program and, uh, and you can join the, the panel discussions starting on the 15th of March right up to the 20th of March and I hope you enjoy the festival. I am Fred Kumar. This is just one of my books. I've published many books across different genres, novels, short story collections, autobiography, biography, and so on. And uh, thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy Time of the Writer Literary Festival. I am Fred Kumalo. Bye-bye. Ndogo Zondlovo is a young man who is determined to create a world-class African web leadership institution that will transform public rural schools into self-reliant lifelong learning institutions. He wants to see children in rural communities receive an education that includes a focus on arts, sports, information technology and leadership. At this year's Time of the Writer Festival, we want to recognize South African champions who are doing sterling work by broadening access to literature and who are contributing to social transformation in South Africa. While children in urban areas can easily access literature on the internet, many children in the rural schools still depend on printed books donated by Dogozo Siafunda Donate a Book Project for their only source for literature. Dogozo's work with the Siafunda Donate a Book Project makes it possible for children in rural schools to have access to literature. This makes him the worthy winner for the Time of the Writer Festival's inaugural Literature Champion of the Year Award. This is such a humbling moment. Uh, and we are pleasant. Uh, so we need to do more. We just need to carry on. There will be a lot of dogs and dogs uh, that will multiply through their food. And uh, we wish and hope and believe we will see it. Uh, they are using these books to make That's all we want. So we are happy when kids are inspired like this. And, and let's have more dogs and dogs. Writers, thinkers, activists, lovers of reading, there is a home for all at the time of the Writer Festival. This year's festival is presented on a four meal time slot including a one-hour lunch special slot. The dinner table series at 7 o'clock each evening is a moderated session with writers discussing dominating themes in our social discourses. These themes are also sub-
Our series at 5 o'clock every day will feature writers, thought leaders, and professionals. They will all draw from their personal and professional experience. Subjects such as the impact of COVID-19 on creativity, feminism, writing, and teaching reconciliation in school are some of the themes to be discussed within the cocktail hour session. Let's take a look at our writers who are participating in the cocktail hour session. coffee club at three o'clock every day where we're having a series of conversation with theater makers who have adapted novels into plays. They will talk about their works, their processes, and why adapting from print to stage is a dynamic way of introducing literature into newer audiences. lunch hour event, the Time of the Writer Festival will offer an opportunity to aspiring writers to discover how they can get their works published. The brunch event at 11 every day will teach you how to speak everyday Zulu and also how to avoid the pitfalls of translation. The brunch hour series will delve into the language of KwaZulu-Natal province and showcase some of the exciting development taking place to readdress some of the historic and inherited challenges of language inequity in South Africa. The Brunch Hour will also provide an invigorating session on how to up your side hustle. Moderating the discussions are an array of personalities ranging from journalists, celebrities, scholars and thinkers. This is going to be six days of inspiration, but it will also be one day of poetic celebration. This year's Time of the Writer Festival will end on the 21st of March, a day that we in South Africa commemorate as human rights. We'll also join the world in celebrating 21st March as International Poetry Day. I am Sipindi Lehlongwa and I thank you for joining us this morning. 
Do download the Time of the Writer program from our website and join us for the seven engaging and inspiring mealtime conversations.